Uh, Hebrews chapter number 11 is where we are still. Hebrews chapter number 11, if you'd be so kind to turn there. Hebrews chapter number 11. What is the whole subject of chapter 11 Hebrews? It's, yeah, it's all about faith. Uh, it is no chapter like it in all the Bible. It is, it is faith from the beginning, faith right to the end, and faith everywhere in between. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 11. And uh, so we've been uh, marching right through this text, uh, trying to ask the Lord what he would have for us. And so chapter number 11, verse number 13 Starts off this way, these all died. Verse 13, these all died. Right? What a way to start, right? Uh, but they died in faith. I, I guess we should start this way too. If the Lord tarries, we're all going to die. Amen. Me too, that's what I want to be. But if he tarries, we'll die, you know. Um, but either way, I want to die in faith. How about you? I want to die in faith. I want to die believing. Uh, when we read here, these all died in faith, we know that it's referring back to some other uh, people that have been brought to our attention in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And I, I don't think it goes as far back as Noah and Enoch and Abel, I think that these all died in faith is referring back to verse number uh, eight, which is Abraham, verse number nine, which is Isaac and Jacob, uh, and verse number 11, which is Sarah. And this would be what we call the patriarch family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah. And the fact is they all died. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah all died, but they did die in faith. And they're not the only ones that died in faith. Uh, along with the descendants of Jacob, which would have been his sons, uh, including in that company is Joseph, who we've been looking at on Sunday mornings, Joseph, the son of Jacob. And then after Joseph, of course, there were, they estimate, two million others descendants of Abraham. And they all were born and uh, their number grew in Egypt. So here is Abraham who was given the promise. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and he passed that promise from God onto his son Isaac, who, whom passed it on to his son Jacob, who then passed it on to his son Joseph, uh, who then passed it on uh, through all those that were born in Egypt. So the company of not just Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah, but the company of maybe two million uh, that were uh, born in Egypt, uh, many of those died in faith. And they did not get to realize, they did not get to realize all that was waiting for them when Moses, under the power of God, brought them out of Egypt through the plagues of the Lord, and then uh, under Joshua, they went into that promised land. There were millions of Jews, descendants of Abraham, who had to die in faith. That's what this passage is about. Because you'll see there in verse number 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. And the promises were... You're going to get this land, which is there next to the Sea of Galilee and the Red Sea and, and, and the Great Sea, the Mediterranean on the one side. They're all cooped up in Egypt. And so they don't get to see it. I, 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 let me rephrase that. They don't get to receive it, but they were able to see it. That's what this passage brings out. They were able to see it. These all died in faith. I wanted to uh, highlight one particular old passage, Old Testament passage that that I think in in uh, in the best form encapsulate that these individuals died in faith, not having received it. Hold your place here, and would you please go back to Genesis chapter number fifty? Genesis 
Genesis chapter number 50 and verse number 25. Joseph 50, uh, Joseph 50, Genesis 50, 25. If you find the book of Joseph, let me know where that is. Verse 25, the Bible says, And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. You know, one of the uh, in, uh, popular things on the History Channel is is the you know the sarcophagi of the Egyptians and the pyramids and the and the coffins and the embalmed uh, potentates and pharaohs and. And 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 the then the treasures that are found and and you could you could go on a binge watching all of of those uh, historical um, uh, programs and documentaries. Well, Joseph was embalmed in Egyptian style. Joseph was the second highest ranking person in Egypt, just under Pharaoh. I would imagine he received a pretty big funeral and got a pretty fancy coffin. And they did a great job embalming him to preserve his body. But 400 years later, he made, or he made this promise that 400 years later, he told Israel, his family, all the ones that would come in four centuries, here's the oath, when God visits you, and he surely will visit you. And when he takes you out of this land of Egypt, take my bones with you. Does it sound like Joseph died in faith? Yeah. Now, he didn't receive it. He was one of the ones of a couple of million of Jews for whom the promise was passed down from God to Abraham and so forth and so on. But he wasn't able to receive it. But he did die in faith. And in, in, in Hebrews, where we have been in chapter 11, it's really important to see the change of of words, and, I, and I'm trying to remember what kind of word this is, uh, you English experts. Um, many of the verses, it says, by faith they did it, the word by, and then now in, in verse 13, it says these died in faith. So what is, what is it? It's a preposition. I knew that. I was just afraid to say it. Uh, it is a preposition. Uh, it's not just for spice of variety. That it, it, that the, it's not just a, a change of pace or, or just to make it sound different. That all of Hebrews 11 so far has been by faith Noah when he was warned built the ark, and by faith uh, uh, Abel uh, uh, prepared to sacrifice, and by faith, 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 and by faith. And now we get to verse number 13, and it says these all died in faith. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. The change of preposition is for a reason. I don't think we really die by faith. We should die in faith. The act of our dying, maybe unless you're a martyr, I thought that might be the exclusion or, or the outlier, uh, but to die by faith is not what most of us will do. But to die in faith is what I want to do. To die maintaining my faith. To die in such a way that my faith is as real as the moment I first grabbed it, took hold of it, uh, to die in faith. To die in faith, as is, is uh, mentioned in verse number 13, different than dying by faith, means that it is a state of being. In other words, these early believers in God and his promise took their faith to the grave. Took their faith to the grave. Their dying changed nothing about what they believed. In fact, their dying confirmed what they believe. I wanted to uh, mention for prayer tonight, Al Cantrell is in the hospital and they've stopped, you know, he's not eating or they've stopped 
you know, any feeding or, or, or water, and, and they don't think he has much time left to live. I went to go visit him and his family today, and um, I was so glad that as, as all of the family was there, at least what I could tell, children, grandchildren, the, the room was full, that I was able to say for Al that on a couple of occasions I was able to talk to him, and Al is dying in faith. In faith. Not just any faith, by the way. You can die believing in something and you can die believing in the wrong something. It's clear from Hebrews 11 that those that were dying were dying in faith on the promises of God. And God has given us terrific promises, wouldn't you say? Now in Hebrews 11, the, the, the promises are mentioned, or are at least listed here back, if you'll turn, turn back to where we begun, have begun tonight. It says in verse number nine, by faith he sojourned in the land of what? This is verse nine. In the land of promise, right? That's why we call it the promised land. It was a land promised. As in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, not a different one, of the same. And so this promise is important. They did not die just in any old faith. They died in faith on a sure promise of God. You know, a lot of people put their faith in the wrong promise when they die. They put their faith in the promise of a priest, put their faith in the promise of good works, put their faith in the promise of a false gospel, put their faith in the promise of religion, put their faith in the promise of some other form. But it's not enough just to die in faith. You've got to die in faith of the right promise, the right promiser. And that person is, is Jesus Christ. And we have great precious promises now, I know we're, we're, we're sort of scurrying back and forth here. Always keep your place in Hebrews 11, but let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I read these scriptures at the hospital today for, uh, for the Cantrell family. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Right at the beginning of this epistle, the Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Would you just enjoy this thought for a moment that the faith that you have in God is the same precious faith that Peter had in God? The faith that you and I have in Jesus Christ is the same precious faith, right, that John the Apostle had? It's no different. Theirs was no greater or no less than ours. It is like precious faith. It is the same. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then in verse, in verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And I, I just comment on that verse to say, I'm glad God has given me everything I need for life. God hasn't shorted any of us. Some say, well, I, I didn't know. There's no way I could have known. There's no way I could have done better. Yes, there is. Everything we have for life and godliness is supplied. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us, thank God, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And in that hospital room on the fourth floor of Medina Hospital, I just went over some of the great promises that we have from God. Like I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. What a great promise. The promise that whosoever cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I don't want to be an outcast. If you come to the Lord, you're not an outcast. You're not rejected. I mean, such great precious promises. 
promises that God will take care of widows. What a great promise. As Brother Al might be going home soon. These are the great and precious promises that we must cling to as well. The promises of God, the promises of the word of God. And it's those promises that we want to die in faith holding on to. I'm not so sure what is all included with the, with the uh, operation of giving last rites. Although I've heard of it for the Catholics. You, you got to have your last rites. It's almost as if the Catholics believe they have to be infused with one, one last spiritual shot before they go. And by a man, and, and, and that makes it worse. No man has to give me a spiritual shop at the end. God has given us so many precious promises that will take us through the other side. These promises from God are what we cling to and it's what we hold to. It's what our faith is. And our faith is in God. Now, last week we, we talked a little bit about prayer and I wanted to hit on this again tonight just to explain myself further. Uh, this this uh, this name it and claim it kind of thing that's that's moving around in in Christianity is false. We don't name and claim anything with God. You don't get to name your wishes with God. Now God wants to hear all the things you desire. Isn't that wonderful? That he wants to hear it. But we don't get everything we desire. Anybody else experience that? <laughs> we, we don't get everything we desire. We don't get everything we ask for. Jeremiah 33 and verse number three says, call unto me and I will answer thee. I'm glad that God answers every time. But I have learned sometimes his answer is no. But he answers every time. But sometimes his answer is, is no. In John 14, 14, Jesus said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But I think the key phrase is there, it's about God's name, not ours. It's not just that we ask in God's name as if it's a magic word. Whatever we ask in God's name means this. The answer, I want to glorify your name most. That's how we pray. I ask it in your name. I ask it for your sake. I ask it for your glory. That's why in the model prayer, Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. So in other words, whatever you would want, God, that's what I want done here. Whatever the will is of heaven, that's what the will that I want in my earthly realm. The same this name it and claim it philosophy tends to teach that if you could just, um, uh, if you can conjure up enough belief, if you can generate and churn up enough belief in your heart that you could ask for it and you'll get a yes. It's not true. It's not true. It's not about us conjuring up enough faith to get a yes. It's really about us having enough faith to be happy with a no. And that takes more faith. It takes more faith in God to be happy with a no. These are promises that we have from the Lord. Rather than worrying about doubting God's power, we should rather worry about doubting the goodness of his will. God can do anything. Amen? He can do anything. But he will always do what's right. He will always do what's right. There's some helpful verses, I think, in Luke chapter number 11 about this subject of prayer. In Luke chapter number 11 and verse number 10, Jesus gives some analogies here about a father and a son. In 
In verse number 10, the Bible says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? What, what do you think is the answer to that? No, no. Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Would a dad do that? No, a dad wouldn't do that. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Oh, dad wouldn't do that. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now the purpose behind, I believe, what Jesus is teaching here is not that if you ask bread, you get bread. What he's saying is, if you ask for bread, I won't give you a rock. In other words, I won't give you something hurtful. Look, uh, the next illustration is this. If, if, if you ask for a fish, I'm not saying that you'll get a fish, but I promise you I won't give you a serpent. And if you shall ask an egg, I may not give you an egg, but I promise you I will not give you a scorpion. And I think he packages all of this together in verse number 13. He says, a dad knows how to give what's good to his child. And who knows more, the child or the dad, on what's good? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, parents, do you always give your kids ice cream when they ask? No. <laughs> but they're asking believing. <laughs> right? But you're not going to give them something to hurt them. If you being evil, fleshly, human, carnal, corrupted, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, and I love that phrase, how much more, how much more, how much bigger, how much greater shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Look, God knows how to give good gifts in answer to our prayers. The problem is we don't always know what the good gift looks like. It doesn't always look like what we're asking for. The good gift, I mean. It's more about trusting, not that God is able, but trusting that his will is good. This is the moment of faith for a Christian. And I believe tonight that God knows how to give good gifts to his children. He certainly does. And he will answer and show us great, great and mighty things that, what's the rest of that verse? That thou knowest not. You know, that really has to be, the answer has to be different than you prayed if the answer is something that thou knowest not. You ever think about that? It has to be different than what we prayed. So the promises are there, and the promises of the Lord are wonderful and precious, and these all died in faith. But something else in Hebrews I thought was worth us uh, taking a, a glance at is not only the word promise, but as we sang tonight, it's the word persuaded. Let's see, it's in 11 and verse number, is it 13? Yeah, yeah. They received the promises, uh, they, they, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. You know what that word persuaded means? It means convinced. It means the mind was satisfied. I want you to think about this. Abraham's mind was satisfied that God was going to do it sometime. We already read in Genesis 50 that Joseph's mind was satisfied, persuaded, satisfied, that God will surely visit you here. You won't stay in Egypt forever because God has another land that he promised us. He was fully persuaded in his mind. He had settled on it being true, being persuaded, Faith should be persuasive to us, to be persuaded. They were so persuaded that the Bible says that they saw it. If you look here at verse number 13, they have not received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them. So have you ever heard the phrase, seeing is believing? 
Just take those two words and flip them. Believing is seeing. <laughs> you know, when you believe something, God gives you, when you believe in God, he gives you the ability to see something, to see it. To see it not through the eyes of humanity, but one of the great gifts of faith is that it gives us a supernatural sight, a settled sight. That's why a Christian can say, as Paul did, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Why? Because he was persuaded and saw that in faith. To have such confidence, that rubs people the wrong way when they, when they hear, a, some people the wrong way when they hear a Christian speak so confidently about an object of faith. But real faith gives us sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. It doesn't mean that we walk blind. It means that we walk with a different kind of vision. Nobody wants to walk without vision. So when we walk by faith, not by human eyeballs, when we walk by faith, not by sight, we are walking by still a kind of vision, but it is a vision that is bolstered and born and guided and, and encouraged by faith in God. Do you have that kind of seeing? We ought to have that kind of seeing. Being so persuaded that we're able to see it being so convinced that we're able to see it. It's the kind of faith that Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, and Isaac, and Joseph and his descendants had. And one other word it is connected to, I think, this pers persuaded. The Bible says that they, they embraced them. Do you see that in verse 13? They were persuaded of them and embraced them. We've used this phrase before. Have you ever heard... Maybe just by way of illustration, someone who has a, a physical disability and they say, well, they finally embraced it or they have some kind of deficiency, they finally embraced it or they've lost their job, realize they won't be able to do that same job again and they've embraced it. It's almost like they've accepted it. Here is Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. The persuading moved to embracing in that now it affected their living. It affected their walk on earth. They had embraced the fact that these promises are true and I may not see them in my whole life, but they're just as true. Verse number 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. The third word I want us to see also begins with P and that's plainly. In particular, a plain confession. Now, I was intrigued by this, this uh, verse 14, wondering what it is that was being declared plainly. What kind of declaration? Where was the declaration? Uh, and I think part of the clue for that is at the end of verse number 13 is that they confess something. Do you see it in verse number 13 at the end? So they all had to confess something. And confess is with your mouth. They had to confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. I imagine it would have been something like this. Uh, Abraham, we were over there talking to your son Isaac, and he said something about this whole land is supposed to be yours. Yeah, it will be. Well, it doesn't look like it's yours. Well, I'm just a stranger and a pilgrim. True. I'll confess that. But the problem, the, the promise is just as real, even me being a stranger and a pilgrim. I think the confession was this. The, the, real, the, the real look of the promise may not be evident. For instance, there was a period of time they were slaves in Egypt. Oh yeah, God promised a whole bunch of good land to you Jews, but all you do is crack, crack, make your bricks. Crack, crack, get more straw. But they were able to confess, yeah, we are slaves. And yeah, we are pilgrims. And yeah, we are strangers, but we still believe the promise. And they declared it plainly, clearly, distinctly, concisely. This plain confession was an, was a, would include an elimination of the longing for the past. 
And I think this is what made the Lord so angry with, the, with his people, especially at the time of the Exodus, because you'll notice in verse 15 of Hebrews 11, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now, just pause for a moment, those you, you Bible readers uh, along with me tonight. When they came out of Egypt, there was a lot of talk. What is this? We should have stayed back there. <laughs> the looking back to that was better is not faith. The looking ahead to what God has is faith. You know, Satan's so tricky and he wants us to, you know, Lot and his wife are escaping destruction. And what did she do? She looked back. It wasn't a look back. It is obvious that the looking back was more than a look. It was a longing. It was a, ah. Uh, and it was that longing. It was that, that moment of no faith when her affection was for the past. When these Jews, their affection could have been for the past. I believe that Abraham, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, that his affection for Ur became zero. And I believe 100% of his affection was for what God had ahead. That's why Paul can say, I forget those things which are behind, and I press forward to those things which are before. How many times could Paul have said, you know, my, my life as Saul was a pretty good life. I was getting paid good. You know, I was with the Sanhedrin. I had a little bit of power and, and, and position and people knew my name and I, I was in, in committees and, and I was able to, uh, I was rising up the ranks and I had respect and, and now all I am is beaten and shipwrecked and left for dead and, and stoned and bloodied and, and poor and no money and, and traveling and tired and, and weak and, 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 and thorns in my side. That's all I got now. He could have longed for the past, but he didn't long for the past. He said, I forget everything back there. And I press forward to that which is before. Part of our faith has to be found in a plain confession. And that plain confession has to include the past does not appeal to me anymore. What appeals to me is Jesus Christ, my salvation, my Christian life, and what the Lord has for me going forward. There was a double confession here about the time on earth and in regards to heavenly. And as we round this out tonight, verse number 16, but now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And I think as we finish out this little section of, of Hebrews 11, all the attention has been on that promised land by the, by the, by the uh, Jordan River and, and, the, and the dimensions that God had given in the, in the Red Sea and the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean and, and bordered on the north and bordered on the south. And it flows with milk and honey and all the ways that God described that land. But now it seems as though the, the Lord in this marvelous text says, and they even desired something better than that. And what they desired that was better than that was a heavenly. Yes, there was an earthly, because the verse 13 says they, were, they declared that they were pilgrims on earth. But now the view is heavenly. It was a double confession that I may not have everything right here, but I am going to have everything right someday there. I may not see every complete fulfillment of goodness here, but I will see every fulfillment of goodness there. The earthly part would happen, that's true. The land would be given to them and the Jews would inhabit it and Joshua would go and there would be a conquest and then it will come again later in the future. But this brings into play the heavenly and their longing was for the heavenly. Is your longing for the heavenly tonight? 
1945, there was a Christian businessman who stood up in a church service. It was an evening revival evangelistic service in Dallas, Texas, 1945. And this man stood up to give a testimony. And I like it. Testimonies in church can be a blessing, can't they? So in 1945, he stood up to give a testimony and he stated that his business for months had been going down the drain. And he was going to, it was just going to fail. His business was going to fail shortly. And he was in despair. He felt himself slipping into um, depression. Uh, and he was so discouraged, he said, in this testimony of this evangelistic meeting. So he said he got in his car and he just decided to drive. And he drove across the countryside. He traveled for miles. Tears were going down his eyes. And he went down some busy streets and some residential streets and then some lonely streets and some country streets. And finally, he just got out of his car and decided to walk. Now, this businessman said that he, as he was walking, he was on a deserted, out-of-the-way trail. And eventually, he came upon a dilapidated cottage. He said the windows were busted out and some had cardboard over them. And he said out front there was a little girl. She was playing with a doll out front. And the stuffing in the doll was protruding out of the broken seams where it had been sewn together. But the little girl seemed so happy. And he went to the front yard and uh, he didn't want to frighten the little girl. Uh, so he said to the, he just approached carefully and, and, and softly, and he said, uh, would you be able to tell me how you can be happy living in, in, in this kind of place? You just look so happy. The doll you have is all broken, stuffing coming out, and how can you be so happy? And the little girl looked up with a smiling face and a gesture of her hand and said, Mr., my daddy just came into a lot of money. And he's building us a brand new mansion just over that hill. He said the young businessman, the story said the young businessman testified those words that night at that evangelistic meeting. He said it pierced his heart so much that even though his earthly business was failing, that, that God in essence told him, but I have so many greater things in store for you. Don't worry. It's as if he could hear, he said, God saying to me, son, don't you know that I have a mansion prepared just for you beyond those clouds? And so this businessman gave that testimony. Within a few days, the story made its way to a man named Ira Stamphill. He was a, he was a songwriter, and he was so moved by that story, he went home and decided, I'm going to write a song. And he rose early the next morning and went to his piano and wrote the song. You, you all know it, Mansion Over the Hilltop. And that song starts out with this, I'm satisfied. You know what Abraham was? He was a stranger, but Abraham was satisfied. Amen. Being a stranger. Isaac and Jacob and Joseph all had their griefs and never really able to see the great promised land, but they were satisfied. Their descendants in Egypt to eventually become slaves, they had to have a spiritual satisfaction. And many of them had to die in faith, knowing that God was going to keep his promise. Even if it meant heavenly, God was going to keep his promise. I'm encouraged by... Hebrews chapter number 11, when I see that the Bible says this, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. As I close the Bible, here is the one thing that God has only ever wanted. Are you ready? Somebody ever asked you, what's the one thing you want? Here's, here's the one thing that God has ever only wanted. Is for us to believe him. It's for us to believe him. And I just, I know I'm saying this in, 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 in an echo of what many of you would say. I, I believe him. I believe him. I'm persuaded of it, embraced it. I know his promises. And, and I, I, I want to plainly make that my confession.
to whoever I can speak it to. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But yet, the Bible says that Abraham, by faith, was able to see it afar off. Can we bow our heads for a moment tonight in prayer?